Do one. Here. Come here. Oh, I can just use this here. Oh, I'm just going to stand in the middle, yeah. yeah. So yeah. welcome, everyone. My name is Lara Villamont, she, hers, and I am the head of Outreach and Community Experience here at the Framingham Public Library. We are so thrilled that you've joined us. I see we've got a couple folks online tonight. Welcome. And we're so thrilled that you've joined us for Sustainable Gardening with Kate Donovan from Blackstone Valley Veggie Gardens. She's going to talk to us tonight about ways to make our garden sustainable in terms of plants and also items. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to do just a few quick announcements. We will be having Kate back with us in July in an in-person and YouTube hybrid program. At that point, she'll be talking about canning, dehydrating, and I'm sorry, I forgot the third one. Freezing, canning. Freezing, yeah. that's what it was. As a part of our summer reading program, the theme this year is gonna be Read Beyond the Beaten Path, and it starts on Saturday. So please visit either the Maine or McAuliffe branch and register, or you can also register online, framinghampubliclibrary.org slash S as in Sam, R as in Rodeo. So we hope you'll join us for that. We've also got a few other upcoming programs that are very exciting. Our jazz concert series and Framingham Sound Saturday concert series are starting, so visit our website for more details on that as well as a ton of other reading programs. Just a reminder, the summer reading program is for adults, teens, and children. Everyone is included, invited, and there are some phenomenal prizes this year. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kate. Kate, because we've got some folks at home, can you be sure that you speak into the mic? That's how they'll hear you best. Okay, very Thank good. You so Thank you so much and welcome. Thank you, Lara. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is, as Lara said, Kate Donovan. I'm with Blackstone Valley Veggie Gardens. We actually have 21 uh, presentations on sustainable, sustainability and gardening in general. And, um, and there's a way that you can actually tap into that. And let, let me explain. Um, in this slide here, you'll see my, my, my email address is bbveggiegardens at gmail.com. Please email me uh, and I will send you a copy of this presentation. My presentations usually have embedded videos. They have a lot of cheat sheets and links and all kinds of good, valuable information. So please, uh, you know, feel free to use that uh, to contact me. Also, the bottom is my website, BlackstoneValleyVeggieGardens.com. There's a contact us tab on there. So if you do want to send me an email that way, please do. Also, you can ask me anything about gardening. I may not know the answer, but I surely can find it out. I have a Facebook page of 68,000 gardeners worldwide, and I, I love to crowdsource. I am also the president of the Blackstone and Millville Garden Club, and we have some mighty good gardeners there from, you know, folks that grow ornamentals and native plants to food growers, etc. So, uh, let's get going. Okay, this presentation is on sustainable gardening. And as all my presentations, this presentation uh, is, is, uh, comes from, this comes from, from COVID. You know, remember, we, we didn't know, we, you would go into a store and, you know, you, you may not find anything, the, the, the cupboards were bare. So this is all about doing more with less. Uh, less work, less money, less effort. It's also about building a little cushion, a plan B, so to speak, just in case. What is sustainability? Well, the dictionary tells us it's the ability to be maintained at a certain rate or level, which is pretty difficult in the world's worst pandemic. Um, also, it's the avoidance of the depletion of natural resources in order to maintain an ecological balance. I am, um, first and foremost, uh, you know, not only am I a sustainable gardener, but I'm an organic gardener uh, as well. So we need to be good stewards of the earth. And that's a part of sustainability as well sustaining the Mother Earth because she has to sustain us. So, what are we going to talk about in this presentation? Excuse me so much. I'm going to just dim these lights so folks at home can see the screen better. Oh, very good. Thank you. Um, we are going to talk about growing perennial food. 
a food forest in your own backyard. Uh, we're also going to talk about preserving. We're going to touch, as Lara said, I will be back to discuss the whole candy freezing and dehydrating presentation, but let's just touch upon it. We'll also talk about lengthening your growing season. I have to tell you, I live right here in Massachusetts. Um, I think I'm probably in the same gardening agricultural zone as Framingham, 6A, zone 6A. The U.S. Department of Agriculture breaks us up into these sections, you know, depending upon when we have our last freeze and our first freeze, etc. So I'm in the same zone, but, but I eat from my garden 9 to 10 months out of the year. I eat my own food. Now, also, we're going to talk about saving money. Who doesn't like to talk about saving money? Just an FYI, groceries have skyrocketed, as I'm sure you're, you're aware. But I don't know if you're aware that they're actually going to go up 4 to 5% more in 2022. So be aware of that. And then in the, in the end, um, you know, if there are any questions and answers, you know, feel free to, to, uh, to ask anything. Okay, so let's talk about perennials, okay? Perennials are the gift that keeps our giver, but if you don't treat them right, they won't treat you right. So let's talk about um, fruit trees, okay? We can talk about a lot of fruit trees, but a lot of them aren't relative to us here in our zone. You know, you'd be hard pressed to grow bananas or mangoes or papayas, However, the ones that we commonly have here that do very well, if they're cared for properly, peach trees, pear trees, apple trees, cherry trees, and plum trees, to name a few. And what to consider before you break the ground to, 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 to plant a, a tree. You have to know, you know, a lot of times we get these trees online and these same tree uh, uh, merchants are selling all over the country. So you have to be aware that the tree that you are purchasing is good for your, our particular zone, which is, and if, you, and if you're not from here, I'm not sure if you're from, from this area, but if you go to Google and type in hardiness zone, space and then then put in your zip code it'll tell you your hardiness zone so our climate we're in zone six so obviously as i stated you know i i explained the, the the ones that we can grow here quite easily another thing to consider is how big do you want the tree now a full-size tree some full-size trees can grow 18 22 feet and some of the dwarf trees grow eight, eight to 10 feet. Personally, I opted for the dwarf trees for a number of reasons. Now, if I have a, a tree that's a peach tree, for example, that's 15 feet high, peaches, when they drop, they bruise. So I'm gonna catch those peaches right before they drop. Um, and the only way I can do that is if I have something that I can actually grasp onto with my hand. So, um, so I, I need something that's relatively uh, short. So, so my, my fruit trees are 8 to 10 feet tall because they're, they're dwarf trees. Also, you, you, have to, you have to be sure that you have enough room in your yard to grow them. For example, if the tree that you're growing, and you have to find this out, you've got to read the tag, and if the information isn't on the tag, you know, in the store, if you buy it online, you have to research it. If you have to get the answers before you buy it. If my tree is going to grow 10 feet tall, I have to space it at least 10 feet away from another tree, or it's going to contend for water and resources under the ground. 
So I have to make sure I space them apart accordingly. If I have a big old, you know, huge old pear tree or apple tree that's, you know, 25 feet tall, I need to make sure that I space that 25 feet away from, you know, the, the, another tree. Now, also, not too, it's not too uh, complicated once you get used to it, but it sounds kind of counterintuitive. Uh, trees are either self-pollinating or they're cross-pollinating. Typically, um, apple trees and pear trees, for the most part, need to cross-pollinate with another apple tree or another pear tree. So you need two. Now, ironically, you can't cross-pollinate a Fuji apple with, a with, a, with another Fuji apple. You think you could, right? You can't. You have to have a slightly different variety of apple in order for the, for, uh, for the cross-pollination to be successful. Same way with the pear. If you have a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a Bartlett pear, you can't cross-pollinate it with another Bartlett pear. It has to be another Anjo pear. Something else that actually comes to, to a flower at the same time. And that's, that's how you do it. And there's all kinds of matrices on that, so you can make sure. And when you do purchase, uh, when you do purchase one, a tree, make sure you know what kind of tree is going to be a good mate. I purchased a pear tree, and a pear tree, I mean, excuse me, I purchased a peach tree. And it was, peach trees are, are, are typically self-pollinating. But it, it bore very little fruit, and, and it was, you know, I, I wasn't really pleased with it. So I called the company and I said, listen, I've had this tree, you know, for three or four years now, and I'm really not pleased with the fruit. And they said, even though the tree is self-pollinating, it will still get a better pollination and produce more fruit with a slightly different cultivar that it can cross-pollinate with. So even though the trees are self-pollinating, and if you have a lack of space, that's cool. But if you do have the space, by all means, broaden your uh, horizon and your backyard orchard by getting, uh, you know, a, a, a one of a similar, uh, you know, the same fruit uh, of a slightly different uh, cultivar. So that's the fruit trees. Um, and the other thing, you have to feed them, you have to fertilize them. They have their own fertilizer. For the first couple of years, you really have to make sure they're watered successfully or, or, or the fruit production will suffer. You may have fruit drop. A fruit drop meaning the fruit will just fall before it's even ripe. So you have to make sure that um, it's fed. And also, fruit trees, um, they, they, you know, when they start producing fruit, there's a lot of sugar there. Who likes sugar? The ants like sugar. Actually, believe it or not, uh, yellow jackets like the sugar, and they may bear it, you know, start bearing into your fruit. So you have to fertilize them. You have to spray them consistently. Uh, and, um, and you have to water them. So spray them, fertilize them, and water them. So let's talk about um, fruit bushes. Now, this is about time. I, I think I got three or four raspberries. Raspberries and blackberries typically grow wild here in, in, in my area, in, in your area, here in, in Zone 6, 6A. And, um, however, those are not the tastiest. The fruits are typically small, and uh, they're a little bit on the tangy side. But, um, I grow, I grow some, some specialty ones that are a lot sweeter. My granddaughter loves them. So let's talk about the fruit bushes. Blackberries and raspberries are actually cousins uh, of each other. And um, 
they're in the rose family, hence the, the massive thorns on those blackberries. You can get a thornless blackberry if you want. Now, let's talk about the blackberries. When you turn over the leaf of a blackberry, um, it's, it's green. Blackberries are black fruited. That's the fruit starts off red and then it turns black. What happens is the, the branches come up from the ground. They're called canes, C-A-N-E, in both cases. They come up from the ground and they don't bear fruit. The next season they bear fruit. And once you pick the fruit, that cane is never going to bear fruit again. So you, when, you, when you prune them in the fall, uh, I mean, excuse me, in the late winter, you can cut it all the way down to the bottom uh, in, in the case of blackberries. In the case of raspberries, you can do the same for your summer bearing raspberries. Now, there are also ever-bearing raspberries. Ironically, uh, they will actually bear fruit on the top of the cane the first season. The fruit will, you'll pick the fruit. And then the next season, you'll actually get, the next season, you'll actually get a flush of fruit on the bottom of the cane. So just because you see fruit on the ever-bearing raspberry and you, you pick it, don't cut that cane back or you'll lose your, your next season's fruit. So you have to know what type of, uh, you know, what the, uh, the habits of that particular plant are. But blackberries and, uh, and uh, uh, summer-bearing raspberries, first year, no fruit. Second year fruit, at the way in the, in the uh, end of the winter when those canes are dormant, you cut them all the way to the bottom and you'll be all set. New ones will grow back the next year. Now, um, uh, raspberries are a little different than blackberries. Raspberries come in red, they come in yellow, and they come in black. A black raspberry is not a blackberry, it's a raspberry. The, reason, the way you can tell the difference is if you flip over the leaf of a, of a raspberry, you will see that it's blue on the, on the underside. And the canes themselves have a bluish hue to them. So um, again, uh, blackberries and raspberries, uh, they, you know, every year they come up and they'll come up where you don't want them to. As I say, they're, you know, they're, they're two perennials at the root the canes are biennial, but they're true perennials at the root, so they'll just keep playing the whack-a-mole game, and they'll come up wherever they want to. So you have to be aware of that. And when you see them coming up where you don't want, dig in there, get a good piece of that root, and give them away, uh, you know, to your friends and family, and, and you can all have wonderful backyard orchards. Blueberries, blueberries, are, uh, they also. I haven't seen any wild blueberries in my area. I know there are parts of northern New England, certainly, that has big, fat, old blueberries, like in Maine, different varieties. Um, but blueberries, um, you know, they're, they're, they come and, and bear fruit in the summer. It's one of the only uh, uh, plants that require soil that's as acidic as, as it requires. You know, the pH level of most plants, you know, is is you know between 6.3 and, and 6.8 but blueberries like the, the soil way down to 5.5 very very acidic so the way i treat my my blueberry bushes is different i don't just give them compost and fertilizer i actually give them a good heaping a uh, couple of uh, inches of canadian sphagnum peat moss it's very acidic and then I put down some good compost and some fertilizer, and then I put a good helping of mulch on top. And, and the way I mulch my fruit bushes, you know, to keep that, you know, to keep that fruit going is um, I use straw. I use mulching straw, uh, very lightweight. It's brown matter. Eventually, it turns to compost. So, and as I had stated, 
uh, perennial maintenance, you feed and you spray, and then you, you prune as well. Um, pruning, you know, it sounds really, really counterintuitive that you'd hack up a plant in order to get more fruit out of it, but you do. And typically, in these cases, you do so in the late winter. I'm talking about late February, because these plants are living things. But in late February, they're dormant. So um, you're, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna put them into shock. Yes, plants do go into shock and you can lose them that way. So definitely prune them. And depending upon, you know, apple and pear trees, for example, apple and pear trees are pruned differently than your stone fruit, your peach, etc. So be aware of that as well and uh, make sure you prune them in, in the late winter. So let's talk about some other plants that are perennials. Uh, Jerusalem artichoke. So we'll, we'll talk about that. It kind of looks like a piece of ginger, right? It is not ginger. It is not an artichoke, and it is not from Jerusalem. It's actually a North American uh, wild crop. Uh, it was it was uh, for uh, it it was foraged, I guess you'd say, foraged by the Native Americans right in our area. We have the Nipmuc. Uh, the, the Indians that lived on the, on the Blackstone. And, um, and you can call it a really reliable food source or you can call it invasive. You know, it depends on your point of view. But these tubers, um, they taste like cross between potato and a, uh, uh, something crunchy, yet kind of like, almost like a water chestnut in a, in a potato cross. It's a superfood, it regulates your insulin. And the whole thing is, you know, it, it grows so easily that I'm sure they'd sell it in the market, but it doesn't have a long shelf life once it's out of the ground. A lot of the stuff you're buying at Stop and Shop or Market Basket or whatever there, whatever is there because it has a thick skin and it travels well from wherever it comes from, but it doesn't mean that it's, um, you know, a, a local, and it certainly doesn't, you know, mean that it's healthy. Um, but the Jerusalem artichokes, they grow and they look kind of, they also call them sun chokes. They grow 10, uh, 8 to 12 feet tall, and they have a little round, looks like a sunflower. Once the sunflower dies off, it's probably, it, 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 and, and, it, and it takes a good freeze, you just leave, basically you can leave them in the ground, and then in the spring, dig them up and, and they're very sweet. Wash them off and you can roast them, you can um, shred them and use them in a, in a raw slaw. Um, you can put them in a stew. You know, uh, you can, anything you would do with the potato, you can do with this uh, Jerusalem artichoke. And you can sell them because people are looking for them. People are looking for native plants. You can certainly sell them on Facebook uh, uh, marketplace. I remember selling them for two dollars a tuber, and I had 200 tubers. So it's, it can be quite lucrative since they're invasive. So you may, you may as well, you know, it's a kind of a pain to kind of clean up the beds, and they grow up. They grow very, very deep. So anyway, uh, definitely uh, Jerusalem artichokes, aka sun chokes, very, very uh, hearty uh, source of food. Asparagus. Asparagus comes in white, yellow, and purple. It takes two to three years to establish a decent asparagus bed. It's kind of finicky, meaning that if any weed gets in there, it doesn't like it, and it'll, you know, it may die on you. But if you do have an established asparagus bed, it can last you up to 40 years. So uh, long, well, certainly longer than I'll be around, uh, you know, 40 years. So. Uh, it's definitely worth it. It's a spring crop long before, I mean, it comes out, I think, probably April, so long before you, your tomatoes are even um, in the ground, you know, uh, you'll, you'll have asparagus. The other perennial plant, you know, the, the gift that keeps on giving is, is strawberries. There are several types. The one I like are whoppers that, you know, I get them, I get the plants bare, we plant some gurney and they've, they've done quite well. Um, but the way a strawberry, I don't know if you've ever grown strawberries, but 
you put in a strawberry plant that grows up and you know you, you see the leaf comes over here and another leaf grows over here and then all of a sudden you'll see a little tiny I don't know not a branch but like a little stick that comes out and and shoots out and, and lands two or three feet from the plant uh, maybe one or two feet from the plant and that's called a runner and at the end of that runner that's when it, where a new a new strawberry plant will grow. So the, the original strawberry plant is cloning itself throughout your bed. It doesn't really, it has, a, you know, strawberries have seeds on the outside, but basically strawberries in your bed propagate themselves, clone themselves from the runners. So, and they do, and they do quite, quite well. Um, the original plant that, that you planted will last a good two or three years. So, you know, so the, the original plant will last uh, only a couple of years. You gotta go in there and clean out the plant every, you know, the bed, you know, every, every either in the fall or in the real, real early spring. Give it some uh, compost and some fertilizer to keep that bed nice and spruced up. But if you keep cleaning up the old and your, and your, and your plants keep making babies from the runners, you can have your strawberry plant forever. Now the other perennial plants that we grow quite well here in our zone are herbs, our mint, our, not basil, basil's an annual plant, but the, the perennial plant, your oregano, your lemon balm, your sage, thyme in a lot of cases keeps coming back. So there are a lot of perennial herbs that just, you know, that just, just keep going. Typically, um, those, the perennial herbs can have, um, they can be a little tough at the root, so they can be a little bit invasive. So when I have my uh, perennial herbs, I typically grow them in containers so that I can, you know, I can control them. Um, and that certainly goes for my mint. As many different types of mint, I have both common mint, which I believe is some kind of hybrid, uh, and, um, and spearmint, two completely different flavor profiles. Um, the mint I sometimes use in savory foods, as do the people from, from India. Um, and the spearmint is good in, in a nice tea or something with lemon, a nice cold drink or what have you. A lot of people you know, might make an extract and use it, use it for baking. So those are perennial plants that you should be growing. Hopefully you can grow at least a couple of them you know, to be a little bit more, uh, more sustainable. So let's, let's talk a little bit, and we're just going to touch on this, a little bit about preserving your food. And I'm going to tell you why we're talking about this, because uh, I'm going to post it. I'm going to post it on my, on my uh, page, uh, my Facebook page, Blackstone Valley Veggie Gardens. Today, I got two squash, two, uh, uh, a summer squash, a zucchini, a cucumber, seven beets, six carrots, a bunch of lettuce. So, I mean, you get stuff comes all at once, especially, especially, um, you know, next month. It, it, so many people have those zucchinis. I think there's actually a day, I don't know when it is, but a, give, give your neighbor a zucchini day. And if you try to do that, they're gonna run like heck because they probably have as many, many as you do. But I want to just give you an idea of what I do with my zucchini. Um, first of all, uh, I have a, uh, a little mini beagle, and uh, my daughter has a 170-pound English Mastiff. Both of them love to eat. Believe me, the little mini beagle just as much because beagles are food-driven, food food-motivated. So what I do when I have too many zucchini is I cut them up into rounds, I put the zucchini rounds in my dehydrator and, you know, take the air out of them and, and, it, and it probably reduces the size by 75%. And they eat that, that's, that's a treat for them. It doesn't, it's not hard when it comes out, it's not hard. It's kind of a, almost a chewy side, almost like a fruit leather type of thing, but they like it, it's good high in fiber and um, it keeps them busy for a couple of seconds before they inhale it. Another thing, just for an example of what we do, because we have, because all the zucchini comes through at once, um, I grate, instead of grating zucchini for zucchini bread, that's far too laborious for me. 
I chop it up in a food chopper. It takes two cups of zucchini to make a zucchini bread. So in each tray of my dehydrator, I will put down parchment paper and I'll put the two cup portions in each of those trays. Then I'll dehydrate it. When it comes out, when it's fully dehydrated, each two cup portion has been reduced to a half a cup. So it reduced 75%. I will then put those, seal them up good with my vacuum sealer. And then in the middle of the winter, when I want a zucchini bread, I will take one of those one half cup portions, put it in a bowl, slowly add water to it. It takes 10 minutes. I'll get that full two cups, and then I'll make my zucchini bread. So that's how you reconstitute it. And that's, that's typical of, of what we would do so that we can level set, we can take all this bounty and, and make our work easier through our, in, in, you know, our, our purse as well, our, you know, our grocery bill, and, and level this stuff out so that it'll last the whole year. So canning, um, <clears throat> as a general rule, unopened home canned food items have a shelf life of one year and should basically be used before two years. Um, typically, if there's no air getting in, and um, you know, they, they, but you, that's that's the safe rule. We have to go with the safe rule, just in case. Um, freezing and canning is good because what you want to do, especially like I, I'm just using the zucchini. For, uh, to, I like I can use tomatoes or or anything else for that matter. What you want to do is you want to pace your food so it lasts through the year. So by the time, this is, this is close to July, so by the time next July comes around, I, I have more zucchini in my garden. So I don't need uh, dehydrated or, or canned zucchini anymore because I can pick it. So really what you want to do is you want to make sure all your food lasts at least one year. And if it does last more than one year, make sure you use the FIFO method, first in, first out. Also, uh, canning. So there's two types of canning. Uh, basically, they both use the, the mason jars, ball mason jars. If you're going to can something that has a high acid content, that's tomatoes, uh, pickles, because vinegar is high acid, or fruit, applesauce, or what have you. You can use an old water bath canner, or you can even use an old lobster pot. That's fine, uh, because the acidity in those foods makes the food um, less apt to develop the bacteria botulism. However, if you're using a food, canning a food that's not high acid, um, peas, beans, beets, carrots, uh, meat, you know, some people, you know, you're growing, if you're growing potatoes and carrots and celery, um, onion, it, you may, not, may as well throw the meat in there and make some beef stew and, 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 and save it in, in, in quart jars. So, you know, when it's, you know, on a, on a cold night at the, at the uh, you know, the middle of January, you can just pull it off the shelf. But when you put the meat in there, you know, you certainly have to make sure you have, you have a pressure can. That's a very dense food, and it, it needs to be pressure canned. Same way, you know, we grow a lot of ingredients uh, in our gardens for chili. We grow the jalapenos, the onions, the, a, a lot of, um, you know, the tomatoes and all that. Uh, add the meat in there and use a pressure canner. So the pressure canners can cost um, you know, uh, 200 you to get a good one, uh, a big one. They, cost, they can cost anywhere, but if you get a smaller one, they're probably like uh, $75. Uh, and as I say, if you have an old lobster pot or something, you really don't need to get a, um, a water bath canner. But just an FYI, anything can be canned in a pressure canner. Um, but not everything can be canned um, in a water bath canner. So you really only need a pressure canner and then you can do anything. It's a little bit of an investment. 
But this is an investment. I have a can, or I can hand that down to my daughter. I can hand it down to my granddaughter. So, I mean, they, they just don't break. And if they do, there's seals and things you can buy. So, also, um, so freezing, um, basically, uh, you know, freezing is good. Um, they can, it can make your food, if you get a good freezer, uh, the, the uh, vacuum sealer, your food can last up to five times more than they will in, in a Ziploc bag. So those vacuum sealers, you can get those. I have one that's called a food saver. It's a really good investment as well. They, uh, I had that, my last one lasted 10 years. I was very heavy with it. Uh, not only did I do my garden stuff, but if I go to BJ's and, and get stuff in bulk, because uh, it's so much cheaper, you know, I have one meal and then I put the, the other one. Or I make a big pot of meatballs or what have you. I would uh, can, uh, I would uh, freeze some of the meatballs by vacuum sealing. You take all the air out and you don't get the ice crystals so it lasts a lot longer. Also, I went over the dehydrating. Uh, dehydrating will take out all the, all the, you know, 95% of the water, not all of it. It, it just isn't possible to take out all of it using the, the home dehydrating method. But the food will last a long time. Um, uh, however, it's, it's in any of these uh, processes, um, you're, you're, you're going to, the, the, the water soluble vitamins, vitamin C and vitamin B, uh, are going to be missing. So it's a good thing to take. If you're, if you're, if you're just living off your cans, it's a good idea to take a, 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 a multivitamin, um, you know, to supplement, or, or B and C to supplement those, those vitamins. Uh, but dehydrating, dehydrating doesn't really go bad because most of the water is out of it. It's not like you're going to get botulism. It's just that after a while, the flavor will be gone. You know, it will, will kind of taste like cardboard. So just be aware of that. I would say the same thing with any of these. It's best to use them within the, within a year until the, the crop comes out again. Or if you're buying stuff from the farmer's market, same thing, until that crop is in season again. Now, this is the website that you, you pay for. Okay, we as citizens pay for the National Center, and I have the link here. So please make sure you send me an email so that I can send you uh, uh, this presentation, so you can just click on the link. But this, um, this, this will tell you everything you need to know, and you know about food preservation safely. What? It looked at over here. So how do I? How do I can? How do I freeze? How do I dry? Obviously, dehydrating is is drying. How do I cure and smoke? Ferment, pickle, make jam and jelly, and how do I store? So you click on that. And it'll give you, uh, you know, it, it, it'll go right down to the recipe. Obviously, it, you know, and, and it has some pretty good recipes, but, and you can wing them. You know, it's like when I get a recipe for, like, a salsa, it'll tell me to use cilantro. I don't like cilantro. I may opt to put some parsley in it or some celery leaf instead. Of, I don't like the flavor of it. But one thing it will tell you, if you're canning, it'll tell you how long to process those canning jars depending upon the size of the jar. So it'll give you some very good information um, and it's good to err on the side of caution. Or you can get very sick if you don't preserve your food properly, especially in the canning space. But this is the United States Department of Agriculture Cent National Center for Home Food Preservation. Like I say, we as taxpayers pay for it. You may as well take advantage of it. So let's talk about uh, lengthening the season. As I say, I literally, um, I'm eating 12 months out of the year, but I'm literally harvesting um, crops nine, 10 months out of the year, okay? So let's talk about winter sowing. Um, a lot of us, a lot of people don't have the money to get a greenhouse, and they don't have the money to set up a big elaborate light room downstairs to start a lot of their seedlings to get a head start. So this is an ideal way to do it. Um, it's a relatively new technique, I'd say in the last 25 years, maybe less. Winter sowing, they call it, and also milk jump sowing. 
what you do is um, you take a milk jug or a water jug, gallon jugs are really good, opaque, not opaque, translucent, you, or, or transparent. You, you cut them uh, lengthwise, uh, widthwise. And then you put in some, uh, poke some drainage holes in the bottom, put in some potting soil, decent uh, potting soil, not seed starting soil. Um, you put your seeds in, water it, water it in real good, and then wrap, wrap some, um, uh, some masking, not masking tape, the uh, duct tape all, all around it, and take the cap off. So what happens through the winter is the rain or the snow gets in the hole on the top, and you'll see that you'll have a, a technique, uh, you'll see the, uh, the greenhouse effect, you'll see it start to, the droplets uh, start to attach to, to the inside of the, uh, of the jug and rain down on the seeds. Seeds don't mind being frozen. Seedlings do, little baby seedlings, but you don't have to worry about that because it's too cold for them to germinate. This is a way to offload a lot of that work that you're doing in the spring. Get this done. This is winter sowing. Get it done in the winter, in January. In the things that, the crops that I find do really well with this, perennial herbs, brassica plants, I'm talking about kale, uh, uh, kale, uh, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, um, cabbage, those are all brassica plants, kohlrabi, um, all that kind of stuff, and onions as well, uh, your alien family, onions. I would say garlic, but garlic you actually direct so in October, so um, that's, that's the only one. And, and uh, leave them out there, and in the spring, um, you'll, you'll look in that jug and you'll see they're wildly green and coming up, and you actually transplant them in the garden right from the jug. You don't have to harden them off, no fuss, no muss, and they, and they seem to do quite well. So it's a new technique. People don't want to tell you about it because then you won't go buying all the seed starting stuff and you won't be spending a lot of money because it's free. I don't typically use a lot of plastic, single serve, uh, single use plastics or even these jugs, but I do um, solicit them from, from friends and neighbors that that want to do the right thing as well. So, um, lengthening the growing season, you can build a hoop house. This is, this is plastic. You can use plastic or you can use a white fabric called uh, row cover. And that keeps it between 10 and 15 degrees warmer, warmer than the ambient air. Every once in a while, we'll have a warm winter and you can actually have spinach and kale um, that will stay a lot, stay, stay green all year, believe it or not. You can also build a greenhouse. I have a hobby greenhouse, but of course being the frugal gardener I am, I, I got it on, somebody never used it, and I got it on Facebook Marketplace for a hundred, I think they go for like six hundred. Uh, to get a, a decent greenhouse, you know, you have to, uh, you know, you'll, Spend probably twenty-five to five, twenty-five hundred to, to five thousand, but um, to get a, to, you know, to get a fairly uh, uh, inexpensive one, you know, you'll go five to six hundred dollars. You may have to heat it if you're using it, uh, and you're trying to use it throughout the the, the, the year. You may have to heat it, um, and you know there are special heaters that don't run into a lot of money. Typically, you don't have to heat it during the day because even when it's cold out. The, the glazing, the material that they're made out of is very re reflective and it heats up quite nicely during the day. Uh, however, as, I, you know, as you know, when it starts to cool off at night in, in the winter, it's just too cold. And then also, uh, cold frames. Um, you can, you know, a lot of times you'll see people trying to get, you know, Craigslist or Facebook, people trying to get rid of old windows. It's in, and they don't last long out on the curb, trust me because a lot of people have the same idea. Everyone wants to be sustainable nowadays. So let's talk about some, some, some hardy, hardy veggies. Okay, so if you, these are cool season crops. You start them early. Broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, collards, onions, rutabaga, 
Uh, typically, you can start them inside or in your greenhouse or in, in, your, uh, in your jugs. These you can direct sow. Kale, kohlrabi, peas, radish, spinach, and turnip. Um, and you can start those in the early spring. And you can also start them now. Or probably, I'd say maybe next month you can start them. And you'll have them grown well into the fall. Because they don't care. If it's cold, they don't care. They love it. So here's the summer, and they can take a, a, decent, uh, a, a decent frost, not a hard freeze, not a zero degrees, but, but they can take a decent frost and keep on ticking. So semi-hardy vegetables, artichokes, cauliflower, celery, uh, they'll, they'll laugh off a light, a light frost, arugula, Asian greens, beets, carrots, endive, lettuce, potatoes, salsa pie, Swiss chard, those you can direct sow, and they can take a light frost as well. So make sure that, uh, you know, don't, don't be trying to grow spinach or, um, you know, or uh, lettuce in the middle of the summer and expect it's going to last for you. It likes the cool weather. And you have to keep planting it in order, in order to get it to grow in the, in the, it'll grow in the warm weather. These crops will grow in the world, but they'll bolt to seed. They're, they're, they're not meant really for, for, uh, for warm weather. So you'll have to keep succession planting them. And here are some, some succession planting from seed crops. I'm going to give you an example. Let's talk about um, uh, lettuce. I grow black seed in Simpson. I grow butter crunch. I grow romaine. Little gem, several varieties. In this early spring, I have them starting indoors on the lights. I have them starting in milk jugs outside, all kind. And I have, a, and when I plant them, and I plant them in probably early April, long before your tomatoes grow, go in, right? I will plant different kinds next to each other because I don't want them to all die at once. They don't like the, the cold weather. And then when, once they start to grow, every couple of weeks, I will stick in another little seed somewhere, you know, in, in that bed so that I'll have a steady supply. Same way with carrots. One year I got four separate batches of carrots because carrots, you put in one seed, you get one carrot. That's not really all that great when you think about it. So what are you going to do? You're going to put in 20 carrots, then they grow, you pull them out, you want to make carrots. So make sure you keep sowing a steady stream of carrots. Same with beets and peas. The peas and beans, the same, same type of thing. You, even though they grow on a vine, you can keep planting a variety of different types so they won't all die off at once. They have short, short life cycles, you know, from, from, from seed to fruition. So capitalize on that. So let's talk about saving money. This is one of my favorite things to do. I have to have it though in order to save it, I guess, but that's all right. All right, so, uh, you know, in the Commonwealth, there are a lot of deals, and they don't pay me to, to say this, but you can get deals on solar panels. You can power your house. You can heat your greenhouse. You can power your drip irrigation for your plants. So instead of continuing to water the foliage that really doesn't need it that much. You can conserve water, be a good steward of the earth, and concentrate on, on watering the roots that really do need it. And then you can send your excess uh, electricity that's generated from your solar panels back to the grid so you can actually have a negative uh, electric bill. If your house is sunny enough. Also, drip irrigation, uh, drip irrigation. Uh, this is very elaborate. You can start off with drip irrigation. They sell the parts online at Amazon, and you can get them at Home Depot. The kits don't have to be that elaborate. It all depends on your water pressure and how many beds you have. If you have just one bed, you have decent water pressure, you may not even need a pump. But it would behoove you to get a timer so you don't have to go out there and turn the water on. Uh, and some of them even have sensors that will tell you that if it's, hey, it's raining out, we don't have to, 
water, because it's already raining, so there's all kind, you can get all kinds of sophisticated uh, with your drip irrigation. So let's talk about compost, okay? Um, I hope you're all creating your own compost. When you create your own compost, this means you're creating your own black gold. And you create compost anyway. Why? Because we're human. We live in houses. We eat. We, we have leftovers. We have backyards, you know, we have leaf, uh, leaves fall in our backyards in the fall. We mow our grass, we trim our plants, all that kind of stuff. What are you doing with it? You can put it, leave it, you know, some people mow and they leave it on to the yard. And then if it gets real hot out, that can actually create, they can actually burn the lawn, they say. But, um, but you can create your own compost. You don't, even if you're not a gardener, you can create your own compost. You can use it to fertilize your lawn with. Um, so what, is your, what, what do you use to create your, your compost? Grass clippings, crushed fallen leaves, coffee ground, eggshells. Listen, since, I don't know about you folks, but since COVID, I have a plethora of cardboard coming to my house. They've done a much better job. They don't do the peanuts anymore and any kind of puffy stuff. You know, they really cut down on the amount of plastics that's being used, but they could still do a better job with the, with the cardboard. I remember the other day I bought two items and each one of them was in a box and both of them together were in a bigger box and then they were actually in a bigger box. I looked at it and I almost cried thinking of that poor tree that had to give its life, um, and then shredded brown paper. So that we do have a presentation on composting. If anyone's interested in composting, please let me know. I will definitely forward off the, uh, the presentation, but it's something that you can do for yourself. It's something that you can do for your family. It's something that you can do for your community and to be a good steward of the earth. So, um, what about seed saving? You have a beautiful, you know, cucumber plant that's done awesome all year. Produced 15 cucumbers from one vine. But what are you going to do with, you know, how are you going to keep that going? Well, why don't you, you know, dry out and save the seeds? If, it, if this particular variety of cucumber did really, really well for you, in your yard, well, the, the spawn of that, you know, the cucumber that came from that plant, the, those new seeds, that new batch, will probably be do just as well. So make sure the best thing you can do is save your own seeds from your own plants. Now, sometimes that's not possible for a variety of reasons. Um, so you can get cheap seeds, and let me tell you how to do it. Okay, um, every year, um, hopefully you, you folks are from, are from the area. I know we have job lots all over the place in this part of, in Massachusetts, uh, in, in Rhode Island. Um, but, but a job lot buys a whole slew of uh, 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 seeds from, from Burpee. And in theory, they go bad, or they expire on December 31st. Does December have 31 days? At the end of December, anyway, they, they, they expire. Uh, or they legally, I guess, they expire. They're not supposed to be sold. But most plants, um, seeds, last, if they're well cared for, three or four years. So uh, the uh, University of Rhode Island and the University of Connecticut typically collects all these, they're the extension services, they collect all these seeds from, uh, from job lot and they give them away. They give them away to libraries and they give them away to senior centers and they give them away to garden clubs and they also give them away to the regular Joe Schmo gardener like, like, like us. 
So you just have to know how to tap into that. So um, keep looking on the internet, URI free seeds or Yukon free seeds, and you'll see some come up. What you might not, you might, and, and you know, and they'll give you a list and you can check what you want. You might check carrot. You might not get the specific purple carrot you want, but it's a good way to get an index, you know, to, to get them for fairly cheap. I think last time uh, they, uh, I, I did it, this is before COVID, uh, URI hasn't been doing it uh, since, I, I believe they will again, but I believe they charge 25 cents per pack for, for shipping and handling, so it was still quite reasonable. So, um, the Dollar Tree has American seeds for 25 cents a pack. You know, the Dollar Tree is now the Dollar 25 tree, right? but the seeds are still 25 cents a pack, and they're perfectly good. I had a look at about a million different videos and do a lot of different research before I say that, but the trees at the Dollar, the, the seeds at the Dollar Tree are, are perfectly fine uh, at 25 cents a pack. Uh, you may not get the fancy ones, but that's okay. Uh, Little Shop of Seeds has seeds for 75 cents a pack. And Dollar Seed obviously has seeds for a dollar a pack. If you want to get fancy, you can go to uh, uh, rareseeds.com or Murphy and, and pay a lot more uh, for your John seeds and, and pay a lot more. But for the frugal gardener, best thing to do is save your seeds. If you can't do that, um, buy the cheap one. <coughs> And by all means, we do it. Start off, um, start a seed swap. Invite your friends and neighbors. We have a community seed swap. We've been doing it for several years now. So it's a lot of fun. You know, you get a pack of seeds, and I remember buying a pack of seeds once. And, it, and, and, and I wanted them. They're red and white special beet seeds, and they're really pretty chioga beets. And, um, and there were a thousand seeds in there, a thousand beet seeds. I mean, I'm not. They have a two to three year shop life, beets particularly, and I was, would never use them. So anyway, I had a blast trading them with, you know, for a variety of different herbs and, and veggies. So let's talk about your cash crops. This is how to make some, make your money back to plow it back in, okay? Garlic, uh, one, you know how to plant garlic, right? You get a, you get a head of garlic, and each clove you, you stick in the ground, and it creates its own head. So if your head of garlic has 15 cloves, you can actually create 15 heads of garlic from, from one clove, from, from, uh, from one head. So believe me, that's more than you need. You can blanch it and freeze it, um, but that's a lot of garlic. So, and you put on, you know, put, put the word out, you have organic garlic for sale. And garlic does not take a lot of space. And besides, you plant it in October, you harvest it in July, and you have a whole bed in July that you can plant other stuff. Do that succession planting with the lettuce and the, and the uh, carrots, etc. So, 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 you know, think about that. Also, herbs, you can dig up herbs, they grow all over the place, or you can actually take cuttings if you want. Perennial herbs grow, grow quite, um, you know, quite, uh, it's a quite a reliable crop. Also, radish, a radish will come from seed to, to fruition, three weeks. So keep a steady supply. You can certainly grow hundreds and hundreds of radishes in a very small space and bring them to the farmer's market if you're so inclined. And then those, the, the Jerusalem artichokes I told you about, AKA sunchokes, I should have used the same one, but they're pro prolific producers with a short shelf life and uh, those will, will yield you uh, quite a bit of money uh, as long as, like I said, you're going to keep them in line because they tend to spread a little bit and they tend to be a little bit invasive. So that is it, um, folks. Uh, if you have any questions, um, let me just explain. Oops, I didn't do that. Here we go. Uh, please, if you want this copy of this presentation, please email me bvveggiegardens at gmail.com or 
You can also email me through my website, blackstonevalleyveggiegardens.com. There's a contact us tab, and that will shoot me a direct email. And while you're up there, check out our YouTube channel. Check out the other events we have coming up, including this one, you know, the canning, freezing, and dehydrating deep dive we're going to get into here. Um, and we're doing a lot of closing up the garden and a lot of whole bunch of stuff. So, you know, definitely keep in touch. So I believe that's our presentation for this evening. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kate, for all your information tonight. I feel like we are prepared to choose the right sustainable things to put in our garden and what to do with them afterwards. So thank you again. Um, thank you all at home for joining us. We hope that you'll be back for the summer reading presentation. Um, she'll do a deeper dive into canning, freezing, and dehydrating. I got all three this time. Um, so again, please join us for summer reading throughout the whole summer. Registrations start on Saturday. When you register, come by the library and you get a free t-shirt. And we'd also like to invite you all to join us on this upcoming Sunday. Again, at the library or on YouTube, we will have be, be having a benefit concert for Ukraine. So please join us for all these fantastic events and thanks again for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was fun.